Hi, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Dr. Juliana Lenach, and I'm here um, with my colleagues, Tom Gidlewski and Lynn Creekmore, representing the United States Department of Agriculture, APHIS, uh, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And we are um, talking to you about rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two um, as a combined effort from both wildlife services and veterinary services. This is a bit of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. And I think we have about a 30 minute um, vi video that, you, that we'll be able to go through. And then uh, we'll have contact information at the end in case there's follow-up um, questions or anything else we can clarify. So I'll go over a basic overview of rabbit hemorrhagic disease and then talk about um, the formation of what's called a coordinating cell for the disease response and discuss our overall goals and responsibilities. Tom Godlewski will give um, more detailed and in the weeds discussion um, on the wildlife impact, um, including the experimental studies, the detection so far in the United States and our response. And uh, Lynn will go more in detail in the epidemiology, vaccine use, OIE reporting obligations. And then I'll come back and wrap up um, and talk about um, additional resources and our outreach program. So just as a quick overview, um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus 2 is a Khaleesi virus. Um, there are two recognized strains of RHD. Um, the original strain um, was called RHD. Um, eventually that was um, named 1 or A. And for the rest of the purposes of this talk, we're specifically talking about RHDV2, which has been recognized for about the past 10 or 11 years. It was um, first noticed in France in 2010. Um, RHDV2 is unique in the fact that it's fatal to domestic, feral domestic, and wildlife species. So uh, that's likely why we're invited to this meeting to speak to you. Um, RHDV1 did not have mortality um, in wild lagomorph species. Both of these viruses are very environmentally hardy. Um, we're aware that, uh, it, at least in experimental studies and, and likely what we're seeing in, in the real world is showing that the virus can survive um, 90 to 100, 105 days um, outside in organic material. And um, current uh, status in the United States is that we had um, individual unique detections in three states in the last three years, and that was Ohio, Washington State, and New York. And then we have an ongoing um, outbreak um, that has hit several of our Southwest states with a recent, um, recent geographic jump. So uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Colorado, California, Nevada, Utah, and then very recently spread to Wyoming, adjacent to the Colorado border, border, and then a new detection in Florida very recently. Um, this, the Southwest detection will be will be the focus here. Um, that uh, outbreak started with a detection on March 24th in Cibola County, New Mexico, in domestic rabbits. Uh, we then quickly reached back to our um, colleagues at the state level and investigated some wildlife mortality events that were being reported and had detections in a black-tailed jackrabbit in Eddy County, New Mexico, and desert cottontails very quickly, um, very soon after that domestic detection. And those were the first detections of RHDV2 in wild rabbits in the United States. At the same time, we were in uh, communication with our colleagues at Senesica in Mexico, and they were also investigating both domestic and wild lagomorph mortality events. Uh, so we began to um, work with Mexico, followed um, an OIE situation report and then weekly reports and spread the word. And then and very quickly over the next uh, six, eight weeks, additional detections in additional states were in fact confirmed. I'm gonna show a video here. This takes about 45 seconds to uh, get started. Um, in the upper left, you'll see detections. Those blue dots are in 2018. Those are actually on the Canadian side of the border um, in British Columbia in feral domestic rabbits. We see a single premise pop up in Ohio in 2018. And then your attention back to the Pacific Northwest in 2019, we see uh, multiple detections in the Canadian and Pacific Northwest um, Seattle area in moving into 2019. And then 2020, we'll show up in red dots. You see New York there, and then our prolonged Southwest outbreak.
and finally should end with a, that, that top detection um, in the southwest is, is actually in uh, Wyoming. And of course, you see a single dot in Florida. And phylogenetic evidence does show relatedness of that Florida detection to the southwest strain. Okay, so what's at risk as far as these detections? Um, again, like I said, for RHDV2, this is both domestic and wild lagomorph species. I, at the beginning of the investigation, the USDA did not have a great grasp as far as the number of domestic rabbits, and that's because it's a very wide and diverse stakeholder and industry group. We have our pet rabbits, and there are somewhere between five and seven million pet rabbits in the United States from the AVMA um, statistics. Uh, rabbits are raised um, as a commodity for meat, which could be for human consumption or pet food consumption, um, fur, which is a um, terminal activity like mink, um, where the animals are skinned and that, that um, those pelts are used for fur coats, wool, which are angora rabbits, and, the, and those are more used as a fiber, similar to sheep um, or ang angora goats. And then animals are also raised um, for biologics. That might be for research and development, um, laboratory testing, specific pathogen-free type of situation. So uh, those groups kind of are, are more what we would typically think of as the agricultural commodity group. And then there's very large and connected groups of um, folks who raise fancy rabbits for show and exhibition. There's a large breeding sector in the United States and the American Rabbit Breeders Association has been a great partner through this and kind of informing us and helping educate us on, on that part of the, the industry and those groups. And then the rescue rabbit circuits are really connected um, groups who work to take animals out of various situations and move them through um, rescue networks and foster homes to, um, to rehome them. And we've had to um, make pretty big efforts to be connected with those groups to avoid any disease, disease spread. Um, wild lagomorphs, Tom is going to go into a little bit more, but those include um, rabbits, cottontails, and hares, including jackrabbits, and pika, although I will note that we do not have any confirmed detection in pika at this time. So this investigation is relatively complicated for, for multiple reasons. Um, one is the geographic spread. Um, and as you saw in that, in that time-lapse video of detections, um, it's transboundary, meaning we've, we've basically got a North American event on our side. Um, Canadian detections first in 2018, then in the United States, and then certainly a concurrent um, outbreak going on right now um, in the Southwest United States and the Northern states of Mexico. Um, wildlife involvement, as we talked about, and anytime we have any disease that spills over from domestic to wildlife or vice versa, um, the disease detection and response um, and certainly our mitigation options are a little bit more complicated. Uh, the presence of feral domestic rabbits. So these are domestic rabbits that have either been set free from by their owners or have escaped um, captivity and then breed and, and basically set up a new rabbit colony um, outside. And there's there are um, domestic rabbit, domestic feral detections um, that have gone on in Washington State, um, Colorado, and Utah. Um, a big issue is that there is a lack of regulatory authority over rabbits. And for, for veterinary services, for APHIS, um, RHD is a reportable disease. So we have an OIE reporting obligation, but rabbits are not considered a regulated species. So we don't have any regulatory authority, but we do have reporting obligations. So that has um, led us to have high involvement from the states, and that's both State Department of Agriculture and State Department of Wildlife to, to get that disease detection and um, get the, that reporting done. So it's a combined effort between the state and federal authorities. 
Uh, that diverse rabbit sector is really unique as far as getting the information out, making sure information is shared rapidly and that misinformation is corrected, especially on social media and some other sites that we've had some challenges with. Uh, Lynn will go into more details on the vaccine and our, our um, complications there and our testing limitations, which, which we think we have cleared up at this point, um, but we can kind of tell you the story of, of how that came through. So for all of those reasons, as far as the complications with the response, um, the APHIS set up what's called a coordinating cell. And, and for this particular outbreak, we involved all three branches of veterinary services, um, which is the strategy and policy team, that's the lead in this case, field operations, which is where I sit, and diagnostics and biologics, and that involves both the vaccine and our laboratory capability fall in the, the diagnostics and biologics team, and wildlife services. So wildlife services is a separate branch than veterinary services, but for, for this investigation, um, VS and WS, uh, vet services and wildlife services have really tackled this together um, and, and have been involved the entire way, which is why we're giving you the presentation as a, as a team, because that's how we're working on this one. A little bit of a schematic of, of what we felt our, our strategy and our goals were, um, were really to, um, during the first phase, improve disease awareness and prevention, and that's development of outreach material, biosecurity, making sure that our international partners, both North American and worldwide, were aware of what was going on. On the domestic side, working through um, epidemiologic investigations, making sure that our diagnostics were rapid and um, accurate, and making sure that biologics were available and working through those vaccine issues. And on the wild rabbit side, um, working on surveillance data sharing and any control measures, even preventing um, wildlife to domestic um, contact um, to try to decrease any uh, possibility for disease spread. Greetings. This is Tom Kitlowski, and I'm glad to be able to uh, visit with you about rabbit hemorrhagic disease today, even if it can't be in person, and we have to use this virtual format. We often demonstrate this disease at Plum Island for the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostician course. And one of the things that's particularly impressive is how fast these animals go from looking perfectly healthy to dead. Uh, we'll, we'll often bring students in to observe these animals. They'll look at them in the cages and they'll look perfectly normal. And before we're done with our five minute observation, we'll often see these animals throw themselves on the side, squeal, paddle, and die. And often we'll see this red foam coming out the nose. These animals often die uh, quicker than you can draw up euthanasia solution. So these animals die quite quickly. They're usually found in good body condition after death. If we have animals that are thin or if there has been a prolonged course of disease, it's probably not rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Most severe lesions of rabbit hemorrhagic disease are seen in the liver, trachea, and lungs. Petechia or hemorrhage is evident in almost all organs, hence the name. And it's a result of poor blood coagulation caused by disseminated intravascular coagulation. The main route of infection is oral, followed by the conjunctival and respiratory routes. Skin trauma is also a possible portal of infection. Liver, spleen, and lung are the primary target organs. Liver has the highest titer of virus, followed by the spleen and serum. Here are just some, some pictures that demonstrate the lesions that we see with this disease. In the upper right-hand corner, we have a normal mahogany colored liver. Next to that, we have the infected liver, which is pale yellow-brown. And when you look down to the lower left, you'll appreciate that these livers have a reticular pattern. And that reticular pattern is the necrosis that we see going on in these livers. Above that lower left picture is, a, is a, uh, another view of a pale yellow-brown liver with that fine reticular pattern demonstrating necrosis. In the middle, we have a, a similar uh, picture demonstrating those, those uh, same characteristics. On the lower right, we have a pale yellow-brown reticular pattern liver, but in addition to that, we also have that chalky mineralization going on. 
Once again, hemorrhage is the hallmark of this disease. On the upper left, we see hemorrhage on the surface of the heart. Beneath that, we see hemorrhages on the abdominal organs. Beneath that, we have a photo of the kidney with a, a uh, infarct at the 10 o'clock area. And an infarct is an area of paleness caused by uh, thrombosis of the blood vessels, loss of blood supply to that area. It dies and it becomes pale. Upper right, just another shot of that normal mahogany liver next to that yellow brown reticular liver. Beneath that, in the lower right, we have hemorrhages on the lung as well as hemorrhages on the surface of the heart. The different differential diagnoses that we see, tularemia and plague are of particular concern because they are diseases that can readily and seriously affect man. Pastorolosis, myxomatosis, enterotoxemia, poisoning, heat, exhaustion, other causes of DIC. One of the main causes of trauma that we see presented one of the main causes of, of uh, death in these animals that are presented to us is often trauma. We'll often see evidence that these animals have been hurt by wild or domestic animals such as dogs. Rabbit hemorrhagic disease one, or rabbit hem the classic rabbit hemorrhagic disease was first discovered in the mid 80s. At that time, a research was done to determine that our domestic rat, that our wild rabbits were indeed not susceptible to the virus, which was very good news. So we had periodic outbreaks of the disease from that point on, and our, our wild rabbits were never found to be susceptible, which, which was consistent with the research and, and, very, and a, a very good fact. Well, 2010 came along, and we noticed that something had happened with rabbit hemorrhagic disease. It now had a broader host range. It was affecting younger rabbits and it was also affecting vaccinated rabbits. We soon discovered that this was because we had a new variant of rabbit hemorrhagic disease, rabbit hemorrhagic disease A or two. This disease readily spread throughout the world. In 2017, we were putting on a, a, a foreign animal disease course at Plum Island and Fawzi Mohammed the pathologist out there, and myself got to visiting. We thought, you know, we probably should make sure that our wild rabbits and, and jacks are, are still not susceptible to the disease. We know the virus has changed and maybe our cottontails are now susceptible. So Jeff Root with the National Wildlife Research Center, a rabbit disease researcher, and I went out to Long Island, the eastern tip of Long Island, and we caught Eastern cottontails and took them over to Plum. And we did discover through our experimental inoculations that our Eastern cottontails were indeed susceptible. They had about a 60% attack rate in the clinical course and lesions were very similar to what we saw in our domestic rabbits that are all of European descent. Some of the lessons that we learned in, in England, in Europe and the rest of the world is that there are very many circulating Khaleesi viruses out there besides rabbit hemorrhagic disease. And these other circulating Khaleesi viruses may indeed provide protection to the pathogenic rabbit hemorrhagic disease. And that might be one reason why we see variable expression of the virus disease in our, in our various wildlife populations. And another thing that they learned in Europe is that when the rabbit hemorrhagic disease is limited to domestic premises, they can usually manage the disease without too much problem. However, when rabbit hemorrhagic disease gets established in wildlife, it is much more difficult to control or eliminate. Various wildlife species have been shown to be susceptible. Our antelope jacks, our mountain cottontails, our blacktail jacks, our desert cottontails, and our eastern cottontail. Some, some wildlife facts of significance are that we're worried about the, the spillover of this disease into our threatened and endangered lagomorphs, such as our pygmies, our New England cottontails, and our lower key marsh, marsh rabbits, as well as the white-sided jack, the Alaskan hare, and some subspecies of American pika. 
The good news is that when we visited with uh, the DNR, the DNRs in the states in the Southwest that have seen significant disease in their wildlife, the populations appear to be bouncing back. Uh, possibly that 60% attack rate that we discovered in the laboratory may explain this. Maybe a fair number of rabbits are surviving. The best way to discover this disease is with morbidity and mortality investigations. With this disease, we often see a lot of dead rabbits on the landscape, scavengers working these rabbits, and even domestic dogs cleaning up these carcasses. And that's a good indication that uh, we need to be paying attention to those areas. We're also concerned about what might happen to dependent predators, such as what they've seen with the Iberian lynx in the Iberian Peninsula. And another thing that we need to be thinking about when we're dealing with this disease is that this, the virus is very hardy and there's a lot of the virus in these outbreaks. So we wanna be careful that our biosecurity is up to speed and we're not inadvertently spreading the virus across the landscape by working up uh, diagnostics on these animals. The role of wildlife services uh, with this disease has been that uh, our, one of our major concerns or one of our goals is to keep track of the um, mortality events in wildlife for APHIS so they can use this uh, for risk analysis. Thank you. And now I'll pass it back to Lynn and Julia. Thank you today. So I'd like to cover just a few EPI highlights. Of course, the first question on everyone's mind is where did RHDV2 come from in our current outbreak? At this point, the source of disease introduction and the introduction point aren't known. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we found with gene sequencing, and that um, provides a little bit of um, intriguing information that's related. And so we'll talk about that on the next slide. The next question is, how is it spreading? And there's not a lot of spread um, that in this outbreak that directly ties to an animal movement. And with many of our diseases in domestic animals, we do a lot of tracing efforts and uh, follow movements of animals as a way to move diseases. But, um, and some of that is, of course, occurring in this outbreak, but it's really not the majority of what we're seeing. We think that typical domestic rabbit husbandry practices are likely a contributor to the spread of disease between domestic and wild populations, and, um, and that that might be a, a primary uh, means of spread. I'd like to stress here that spread is likely both ways, wild to domestic, domestic to wild, and certainly from wild to wild and from domestic to domestic, certainly. Um, but if you think about it, many of the affected states have warmer climates. So outside hutches, pens, and even enclosures with burrows can be common. In addition, owners with animals that are mostly housed inside allow their rabbits to have some level of quote unquote outside time as well. For domestic rabbits, the presence of the disease in wild rabbits definitely appears to be a significant risk factor for some premises. But we found that even rabbits that are strictly housed indoors and don't have that outside time have been affected. So we think there are some other risk pathways in play, maybe mechanical vectors, fomites, forage or feed, or other, other um, pathways. The epidemiologists in the affected states have developed an information worksheet that's being deployed to collect key epi information. And we plan to analyze the results from that effort at some point and hope to identify risk pa factors, patterns, and maybe help provide answers to some of our more puzzling questions. We look forward to being able to provide those findings in a future presentation. Gene sequencing of RHDV2 isolates from Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas by NVS Helfadl showed that they form a single genetic cluster, suggesting that the outbreak of RHD in these states was caused by the introduction of a single genetic isolate into the region. Sequencing also showed that the same virus is responsible for the disease in both domestic rabbits and wild lagomorphs. Further, the virus circulating in the Southwest United States is distinct from RHDV2 isolates collected from domestic rabbits in our outbreaks in New York, Washington State, and Ohio, as well as British Columbia, Canada. 
Additional analysis by NVSL FATL is ongoing to compare additional U.S. isolates and to compare to some of the international RHDV de detections around the world. There is no licensed RHDV2 vaccine in the U.S. There are two killed vaccines licensed in the EU. One is made in France and one in Spain. So for these two vaccines, our Center for Veter Veterinary Biologics, or CVB, is allowing importation with special permit for emergency use under the direction of the state animal health official in states with confirmed cases. So far, vaccine has been imported in all of the affected southwestern states where the disease is widespread in both domestic and wild lagomorphs. Now, importation of vaccines sounds straightforward, but really it's a costly and involved process to import foreign vaccine. So it's our hope that at some point we'll have a licensed vaccine for use in the U.S. Uh, CVB is eager to work with companies interested in U.S. licensure, and this definitely would be better for us as we would get better information on safety and efficacy, as well as hopefully reduce cost. There's a FAQ document available for vaccine on our website, and Julie's going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Because of RHDV2's FAD status, all testing for RHDV2 was exclusively conducted at Plum Island until July 2020. At that point, we changed the status for states where the disease involved wildlife to stable, which is OIE terminology that's basically equivalent to endemic. With the shift to stable status, we were able to support the expansion of laboratory testing in the affected stable states. In this approach, SAHOs in these states are allowed to designate laboratories in their state, lab, a single lab or multiple labs to provide RHDV2 testing for domestic, rabbits, wildlife, or both. These state des designated labs are limited to testing submissions originating from their state. Investigations in these states don't have to be conducted as a foreign animal disease investigation with a foreign animal disease diagnostician um, in charge of the case. So that gives the states even more flexibility in, in dealing with their response. In addition, two national wildlife laboratories, the National Wildlife Health Center and the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study were approved to provide testing for wildlife submissions from any state. So basically they're providing national level testing. The only caveat is that newly positive states, the first wild detection and or the first domestic detection or new to the incident positive species must be sent to PLUM for confirmation. While RHDV2 may be here to stay with wild and feral rabbit involvement, RHDV, RHDVA is not yet present in the US and we need to continue to monitor for this disease where response is more effective because it doesn't affect wildlife. Part of the lab expansion plan includes the instruction that samples should go to NVSL if the state labs rule out RHDV2, but RHDVA is suspected. This ensures that we're still monitoring for that virus as well. In addition to what was occurring in the US and Mexico in 2020, there was a flurry of RHDV2 detections across the globe. And, um, as you can see, it's a wide variety of co countries, none of which are um, um, close to each other. And there was really no rhyme or reason, no obvious epi links, um, specifically links to animal movement. So it's very puzzling why, why this is going on and also sort of gets us back to that idea that maybe we're missing some risk pathways. And this slide is just a, a nice visual of the previous slide, again, to show you how um, widely dispersed these detections are. Finally, USDA is responsible for notifying OIE of the occurrence of reportable disease in the US. And so RHDV2 falls into that category. We reported the initial detections in uh, this outbreak to OIE back in March and attached the report for this outbreak as a follow-on to the Washington and New York outbreaks. We continued this weekly follow-up reporting for 22 weeks, I think a total of 22 reports, until July of 2020 when we notified the OIE that we were considering the disease stable or endemic 
in the seven in the seven affected southwestern states that were present at that time in Washington because the, of the detection of the disease in wild rabbits and or feral rabbits in all of these states. So just to um, be clear, RHDV is still a reportable disease in domestic and wild rabbits in all 50 states and data collection is continuing. In the stable states, this information will go on the next six month report that we make to OIE. While if there are any findings in a new state or a new species, those will be immediately reportable. And this is exactly what happened with Wyoming and Florida detections. Wyoming was reported on December 18th, 2020. In Florida, the Florida detection was reported to OIE on January 4th, 2021. And with that, I'll turn it back to Julie. Thanks, Tom and Lynn. Uh, greatly appreciate that insight. I'm going to wrap us up um, giving you some links to some out, um, outreach material and some resources in case there are further cases or anything that you need information on. Uh, at the bottom, uh, this link is live, and if it doesn't work in the video presentation, please just email me and I'll, I'll get it for you. But this is on the um, APHIS SIA Center for Veterinary or Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health um, homepage for risk identification. And there's a whole section with material on rabbit hemorrhagic disease, a fact sheet, discussions on the early detection um, in the beginning of the outbreak, March, April, May. Uh, cleaning and disinfection guideline, a list of disinfectants we created with the Environmental Protection Agency, and some vaccine frequently asked questions. There's also an interactive map there that um, will be updated monthly with new detections and can be filtered. Um, this was done with our GIS team to allow um, both scale of the outbreak in an individual county and then detections as far as wild, uh, domestic pet animals or um, feral, so you can you can filter in and kind of hone in on time frames and recent detections on that interactive map. It's really got a lot of information in there. Outreach has also been um, both us informing our partners and informing um, the, the stakeholders and other industry folks, and and we've worked um, pretty. We had a lot of outreach in the summer with the departments of agriculture, working through NASAHO, the National Association of State Animal Health Officials, AFWA, uh, the laboratories um, for the laboratory expansion, and then some pockets that we really needed to, to reach out to. Again, the American Rabbit Breeders Association has been very, very helpful in letting us know where their uh, groups are and posting information for us. Our partners in APHIS Animal Care, the Native American Fish and Wildlife Service, because we do have some detections on or near tribal lands, especially in the Southwest. Um, our, everyone in the Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Health Center, um, have been uh, very involved as far as the wildlife disease detections and strategies for surveillance and mitigation. And then some small pockets that maybe you wouldn't think about. Um, zoos, there's a group called the House Rabbit Society. There's a Rabbit Industry Council. And I guess if we can look at a couple of silver linings with COVID, with all of the travel restrictions and um, cancellation of things, we really didn't have any fairs, county fairs, state fairs, or any exhibits where we would traditionally see um, 4-H or those type of exhibits. So we likely had decreased transmission um, from travel because most of those were um, under travel restrictions due to COVID. So um, a little bit of a silver lining there as far as the COVID timing with this with this outbreak. We've also had some public um, help with getting this information out. And because the outbreak started in New York City um, in March of 2020, it was picked up by both the New York Times and the New Yorker Magazine. And that helped get um, public awareness up very quickly. So um, a couple of just clips of those um, outbreaks. It was deemed the rabbit Ebola, um, which uh, is splashy and, and headliney. Um, we also assisted with an article in JAVMA. So between getting public awareness up, using social media and some other platforms to help reach our um, industry and stakeholder partners, and then JAVMA and some other more scientific um, articles to get things um, USAHA and some other scientific publications. So outreach in many forums to get the word out and improve awareness and help people understand um, the, the high need for biosecurity, cleaning and disinfection, and really being cautious when they're introducing any animals. 
So at the beginning, I told you about the coordination cell, and um, while it was created officially with the with the groups from APHIS, Wildlife Services, and Veterinary Services, we very much recognize that both the um, CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and Senesica in Mexico, and then of course the boots on the ground are the State Departments of Agriculture and State Departments of Wildlife, our private practice veterinarians and industry veterinarians, the labs, again, state labs in those affected states that have been allowed to do lab expansion. And then specifically for, for the purposes of this talk, um, the wildlife lab. So understanding the contribution that the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison and Squidus in Georgia have done to really allow um, expansion of those wildlife detections and, and um, bring more of that sampling and, and case reporting online. And then again, our industry and stakeholder folks um, who have really helped um, both with disease mitigation and then just keeping us aware as far as what the situation is on the ground. Here's a picture, a compilation of pictures of the reasons that we are worried about this and uh, continue to be concerned and active. And I know because we're virtual, we don't have any time for question and answer, but um, Dr. Gidlewski, Dr. Creekmore, and myself are all available to you um, if there are any additional questions, if you need follow-up, or just months down the line, if there happens to be a detection, um, again, in your state, or, or if any information is needed, we're all available for outreach. Again, from, from everyone at um, USDA, we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. Take care.